So shooting an elephant by George Orwell. Let's talk a little bit more specifically about what's going on in terms of the context that leads into this. And again, I've got links in Brightspace. You can go to this um, fact sheet and details about British rule of Burma. Uh, this uh, NPR interview, it's a transcript of it, not the video, of someone who's written an article or a book, I think, about Orwell's um, experiences in Burma. And then this last thing is something that he wrote not long after he had come back and he had written uh, this story about what's going on in Burma. Okay, so um, if you look to the sides here of this handout, you're going to see some information, some uh, resources, there's some pictures here, but at the very end is uh, actually the first part of this whole package I've, I've repackaged it so it's it's a little bit easier this is some background that you can read uh, that's actually about what's going on all right so in 1840 something um, Britain was well established in India right they'd been there since the at least the 1700s um, and next door was Burma and Burma was becoming a problem. The monarch at the time was highly despotic and quite cruel. And so Britain was very concerned about his regime. Uh, Burma was also a fairly aggressive country that they themselves practiced imperialism, if you will, that they had no compunction about, you know, taking over a neighboring district or, or area to add to their own power. So they had a standing army. Um, I'm not sure how well armed they were you know with lots of weapons in terms of guns and all that but they actually you know had a, an army and they used it right so Britain was a little concerned about what was going over there um, the other thing that they were concerned about was that they were trying to find a way to build a trade route to China so that they could export their their stuff and trade and all that and make more money um, Burma they thought would be a nice shortcut straight through that they could go to China that ended up not actually happening but that's what they were hoping for so with that in mind they decided they were going to take over Burma and so between 1840 something and late 1860s we had three Anglo-Burmese wars where the Burmese kept fighting against the British but about 1868 the British won decisively uh, and they began dismantling uh, the government and the religious uh, networks of the country so the first thing they did they deposed the monarch Thibwe I think his name was and he had to flee the country uh, and then they broke down the Buddhist monasteries now before the monasteries the monarchy worked hand in hand Right? The monarchy would help support the monasteries and the monks. They would give them money and they would provide, you know, political support. And in return, the monks helped educate the people. They were very much active in deciding policy and that kind of stuff. So all of a sudden, the king is gone and these monks no longer have the money but also they no longer have a say in the government and so obviously they were not very happy about that and then you also had all of this military and the the tribal headsmen and and the royalty the nobles that were also out of a job so to speak right so in order to help diffuse their ability to maybe get together and work together uh, Britain also started uprooting families and moving them to different areas so you might have you know your your family central of power might be in the north and all of a sudden Britain takes your family they they take your land and they force you to move all the way down to the south right so you have a lot of disruption here uh, eventually um, Britain brings in its own schools and so children are being educated uh, by Christian missionaries in a lot of places uh, but also uh, being educated by Britain so they're controlling you know what these children are learning and the ideology and all that kind of stuff and so this is also very disruptive um, Burma had a lot of resources they had a lot of ruby mines that Britain pretty much took all the stuff out of and profited from they also uh, had teak for us the kind of wood um, and elephants were often used were usually used to help haul these these big trunks of trees down for processing um, 
and they had some acreage devoted to rice cultivation but because Britain was thinking that this would be a great export and right, I export it to China and all that they actually required Burma to up the acres that uh, were used in cultivating rice I think if I'm right it went from like four million to 10 million or something like that that's a big conversion there um, and what happened is that these farmers these Burmese landowners had to take out loans to pay for the expansion and they were having to, to mainly get loans from these East Indian uh, basically loan sharks that had really bad conditions uh, in terms of the the contract and so a lot of these Burmese farmers were either foreclosed on or evicted. So you have these people who no longer have a means. They no longer have homes, right? You have lots of people out of work. Um, and one of the things that's also happening is you have a lot of East Indians that are immigrating to Burma. These are Indians that in their own country would not have the social status to actually make a lot of money or be advanced and get really good jobs right so they're fleeing from their country to Burma hoping that um, they can land better jobs right for some of them and that's what happens the British don't bring a whole lot of British troops to, to Burma instead they have you know a, a small cadre of supervisors but then what they do is they um, they put Indian officials in those other jobs right um, but then you also have a bunch of low-wage workers that are coming in and they're taking jobs for wages that are very much lower than what the Burmese would uh, t would work for and so now you know the Burmese have I think at one point they said about a quarter million Indians were immigrating a year to a country of 13 million so you can see that that's actually quite a lot of people uh, so when you mention the when you see the coolie that's mentioned in the story he's an example of some of these low-waged Indian workers that are coming in that have no respect in their own society the British don't respect them and the Burmese hate them and so this coolie's death is one of the more dehumanizing aspects the way they treat it but it's it's again this is part of that understanding the setting what's going on at the time that would have someone have that reaction and that's just you know his place in society is you know really really low okay so um so Orwell by the time Orwell gets there in 1922 uh, uh, Britain has been there for quite a while uh, but the Burmese are still engaging in what we might call guerrilla warfare right they cannot directly and outright um, they can't outright fight against the British so they have to do a lot of indirect kind of fighting and so that kind of explains why you know uh, Orwell says it's kind of petty and aimless the, the, the cheap shots that the Burmese take against the Europeans but you know what other what else can they do they do not have the right to have any kind of weapons right so they are very vulnerable and defenseless which is why Orwell has to take care of the elephant none of them are allowed access to any kind of weapon that could take this rogue elephant down uh, they don't have the right to vote they don't have the right to their own religion uh, Britain is taking all of the profits so a country that actually um, when the monarchy was there they kind of had a little bit more of a socialist kind of structure that the the wealth was redistributed to everyone so everyone had a decent living right uh, all of a sudden you know they're in extreme poverty because of this uh, and these monks uh, have a whole lot of time on their hands because their roles have been kind of destroyed right they're not active they're not teaching they're not doing all these things so they're just kind of standing around and it, it makes sense that they would then maybe militarize or organize and in fact um, later on after Orwell leaves we're going to see that the Buddhist monks are part of this great national movement that eventually gains Burma its independence again right so um, and a lot of other factors but they actually do kind of really band together in an official or way so that's what's going on there so let's think about Orwell so Orwell actually was born in Burma uh, his parents are British so he's not Burmese in any way right uh, but his parents were civil servants or, or his mother was the daughter of a civil servant there they met they married uh, but when he was four they moved back to Britain 
And so he has some connection to Burma. He's got some relatives out there uh, in the British, you know, colonial aspects. But, you know, he doesn't speak the language. He doesn't really know anything about it. So when he gets out of high school, uh, he st he starts thinking about college, but college just does not work out for him. He doesn't like it. He's not doing well. So he decides to join the Indian Imperial Police, right? Uh, and he requests Burma because he's got relatives, right? This is where his parents met and all that. So in 1922, that's where he's sent out there. Um, he isn't given a whole lot of training. I think I read in one one article that maybe he got like six weeks worth of training. Uh, and at 19, he is put in charge of a territory that has 300,000 Burmese, right? Um, and so this is the situation that he's in. Uh, by 1927, he, he comes home on vacation or a break and he basically decides to resign. He is at that point an assistant superintendent or something. So he's actually been promoted. He seems to be doing well. And when he sends in his resignation, the the British, the Imperial Police are like really surprised. And they're a little bit, you know, PO'd at him because they think we've invested all this time. We had no indication that he was unhappy, right? All of a sudden he just resigns. Um, you know, this kind of, I think, is telling when we think about all the times in the story that he talks about not being able to express his unhappiness, not being able to ask for help. I mean, why would they know that he was unhappy if his impression, at least, is that he's not supposed to talk about how he's feeling about things, right? Um, if you've ever read Orwell in high school, you probably read Animal Farmer 1984. And I think what you're going to see is the genesis of those works is here in Burma that when he sees imperialism, the fascist nature of it, and then later on in 30, 1936, he goes and he fights against the fascism in Spain in the Civil War. Um, he makes it his life's work to speak out against these things. So I think it's very interesting in this story, he is silenced he is oppressed by this imperialism and by his own perhaps prejudices and the effect that it has on him is actually then he starts writing about it he changes his name to George Orwell to protect his family he says because he knows how volatile what he's saying is if you think about the novel Burmese Nights and this story were published in about 1929 right a uh, two years after he left Burma think about 1929 in Europe that's on the verge of World War II you have the rise of fascism and nationalism um, in Britain the empire is crumbling right they're they're having a lot more challenges they've come out of World War one you know where so many men were killed um, it was um, a very disheartening kind of war the kind of cruelty and extreme millions and millions of people killed in ways that were never seen before in a major war you know Britain is really struggling to maintain that British superiority and that sense of identity and so here he's writing this novel Burmese Nights and then this story shooting an elephant that is highly critical uh, of and even and again in the story he calls it evil what they're doing um, you know that's pretty courageous so even though he is fairly cowardly I think in this story you can see the consequences of it that he didn't he didn't just slink away he decided to fight the battle in a different way um, and you know and again the influence he's had on society has been quite incredible because of that right so again, there, the rest of this, you can read this and you can see, again, here, one of the things they say here is this idea about saving face is an important theme. You might want to talk about that. Okay. All right. And if you cite anything in your essay from this part or anything from one of these sidebars, like if you want to use a definition or something like that, uh, then you will use the work cited right here by Janet Allen because any of those sidebar comments or anything on this last two pages that's what the editor of this book wrote right however if you're citing anything in the story that's right here in this part that's Orwell and you'll see right here this is the work cited entry for that okay alright so let's just talk about then the story